Hi, this is Bruce Hornack, and this is part three of the three-part series on the restoration of this Remington Model 24. Part one was about re-bluing the barrel. Part two was about refinishing the stock. Part three is going to be broken into four parts. The first part is going to go in depth in showing you how to readjust the action between the barrel and the receiver. It's called the take-up adjustment and the components are take-up adjustment components. And whether you plan to restore your own Model 24 or are just interested in finding out how to adjust the action between the barrel and the receiver, this is a really good video for you. Not only will I go into depth into how to adjust this, but I'm going to discuss a way that you can make an indication on the barrel adjustment ring so that in the future, when you want to adjust this action, you can set this perfectly without ever having to connect the barrel to the receiver. Even if you were to take this adjustment ring completely off the barrel and thread it all the way back on without ever having to put the barrel into the receiver, I'll show you how you can hit exactly the right spot so that you never have to worry about it again. So <clears throat> part two is going to be a little bit of a discussion on the electrolysis process. Uh, you know, I really didn't need to do a lot of electrolysis. I only needed, by the time I got around to thinking about doing the electrolysis, I had already finished bluing the barrel and the receiver. So the only parts that were left that had a little rust on them that I might be able to take advantage of the process with were the, uh, the trigger plate, the uh, butt plate, all of the screws and the trigger and there were some other internal components, but they're very small. So I just set up a process using my uh, drywall mud bucket. It's only about this long and this wide. And uh, I, had, I knew I had all of the components, so I didn't have to spend any money on it. And I'm glad I did it. I was doing it mostly as an experiment, but it turned out it worked pretty good. So definitely take a look at that if you think that you're going to re-blue some of your parts that have some rust on them. Part three is going to be the assembly and disassembly of the receiver. So when I had to take the receiver apart to blue everything, um, you know, I got a good lesson into what to watch out for. So if you're thinking about re-bluing your receiver or whatever on your rifle, you'll definitely want to see this video because there are several parts that will get you past the gotchas because there are some tricks to this that you're going to want to know about before you get started. And the last part is going to be uh, as I had indicated earlier, um, how to make a spanner socket for tightening the nut that secures the buttstock to the receiver. You know, it's a, a special tubular nut that screws onto the end of the magazine tube because your magazine tube travels all the way inside of the buttstock. And the Nut, the tubular nut goes on the end, just has a couple of little, it's, there was, it's designed to use a spanner wrench. Well, you know there's no spanner wrench uh, available anymore for the Model 24. Anyway, I'm going to show you how you make a spanner socket that is so, so easy. It's not that hard to do, and it's going to be the one tool you're going to want to have. Uh, you know, if you're going to, let's say, take it apart to refinish the stock or any kind of, uh, even if your stock has gotten loose and you need to retighten the stock to the receiver, it's a really good tool to have. So make, ter make sure to stay tuned for that. Anyway, without any further dialogue, let's get into the barrel take up adjustment. To break down a Model 24, push forward on the barrel take up lock Pull back the breech lock and twist the barrel 90 degrees counterclockwise. In order to understand how to adjust the action between the barrel and the receiver, let's begin by understanding the components. 
First, remove the forend and let's have a closer look at the barrel take-up ring and the barrel take-up lock. Notice how the barrel take-up lock has a single tooth that slides into the detents on the barrel adjustment ring, which locks the ring in place. In order to free the barrel adjustment ring, you have to slide the barrel take-up ring back until the barrel take-up lock clears the adjustment ring so you can make adjustments. Now let's slide the take-up ring off the end of the barrel to take a closer look at how it works. The barrel take-up lock slides in the barrel take-up ring in a channel and is retained by a plunger and spring, which could fly out if not careful. Notice how the lock slides back and forth in the channel, and on the underside of the lock there is a recess the plunger presses into. Depending on the size of your plunger, you may need to use a fine screwdriver to depress the plunger to slide the lock back into place. Ordinarily, it takes five or six attempts of taking down the barrel, making an adjustment, then reinserting the barrel back into the receiver to find the specific detent for the action to be adjusted correctly. One way to simplify this process is to identify the proper detent for the perfect action, then marking the detent with a brightly colored paint that is easy to see. With the adjustment ring in its optimal location, drop some paint into the detent the lock would slide into. After the paint dries, thread the adjustment ring to the top of the threads, counting the rotations. On my rifle, it's less than one rotation and stops when the painted detent is in the one o'clock position. Now, when I rotate the painted detent back to top dead center or the 12 o'clock position, the adjustment should be perfect. Let's find out. There it is, a perfect fit. Sometimes the clearance between the barrel take-up ring and the barrel is so loose the take-up ring slides off the end of the barrel when you tilt it up to disconnect it from the receiver. This can be adjusted by compressing the leaves on the barrel take-up ring. This reduces the diameter of the take-up ring which will press against the threads on the barrel. All four leaves can be compressed at the same time by putting that half of the take-up ring into a vise. It takes very little force to compress the leaves, so be careful, it's easy to overdo it. One way to expand the leaves back out if you've made them too tight is to take a fine bladed screwdriver and stick it into the lateral splits and lightly tap it with a hammer. You can do that on both sides, which will expand them back out again. Because electrolysis does not remove rust pits, it may not be appropriate for parts that are deeply pitted. The only parts of my project that electrolysis was going to be good for was the trigger guard, the butt plate, the trigger, and some screws. Since I didn't need a very large bucket for my project, I began by bending a half inch by eighth inch metal strap to conform to the insides of my mud pan. I used a disc sander to sand off any rust or bluing off the strap. Even though distilled water is recommended for electrolysis, I just filled my pan with regular tap water. I added a teaspoon of this super washing soda that's supposed to improve conductivity. I used my paint stirrer to make sure that the super washing soda was thoroughly dissolved in the water. My battery charger was set to 2 amps or trickle charge and the positive lead was connected to the anode on my electrolysis device. 
The negative lead was connected to a half inch bar that I had planned on suspending my parts from. The first parts to be suspended in the electrolysis were the butt plate, then the trigger, and there was also a firing pin. After plugging it in, this is what the action looked like. It looked like a good sign. An hour and a half later, I was shocked to see that much rust floating on the surface. The trigger and the trigger guard were buffed on the outside before bluing. The underside was not touched, and that's how well the bluing took just from the electrolysis. The front of the butt plate was also buffed before bluing, but the backside was not. That's how well the blue took just from electrolysis. If you plan on bluing your trigger guard, the trigger, the breech block, or any of these components, you will need to take them apart. Push forward on the trigger guard, pull back on the breech block, and lift out the assembly front first. Pry the magazine spring off with your fingers, but hold on to it. It's going to want to fly out of that breech block. Compress the recoil spring and the recoil spring plug at least 3 eighths of an inch into the breech block so that the recoil spring plug clears the upright and the trigger plate. Slide the firing pin out of the breech block and make sure you're aware of the fact that there is a firing pin button down in the firing pin that the recoil spring pushes against. If you're not aware it's there, you could potentially lose it. To remove the breech block, depress the slide button with your thumb. To remove the trigger, you need to remove the trigger pin. First pound it out far enough that you can grab the rest of it with your fingers and pull it out. Use the trigger lever to help reposition the trigger so that you can slide the spring off the trigger tang. You'll have to remove that spring in order to get the trigger assembly out. Then the trick is to twist the trigger in order to lift it out. To remove the safety, you will need to push it out from the right side to the left, not the other way around. But before pulling it out, altogether, put your thumb above the safety area because there is a spring and a stud that will come flying up as you remove the safety. This is the easiest part to lose in this entire rifle. Putting the gun back together in reverse order, let's begin by putting in the safety spring and pin. Before putting the safety back in, notice that the left side of the safety has a tang sticking out. And if you look at the receiver on the left side, it has a groove where that tang is supposed to slip into. That was the reason you had to push the safety out from the right to the left. Now in order to get the safety over the pin and spring, you need to compress the pin. Of course, the safety won't slide in completely unless that tang is lined up properly. Now twist the trigger into the trigger plate. It doesn't matter if it's a left twist or a right twist. 
but it needs to twist in in order for the spring tang to clear. Use the trigger lever to position the trigger so that you can slide the spring over the spring tang. Once you think you've got it in place, before putting the pin in, make sure that the trigger will move the firing pin release at least an eighth of an inch. If it doesn't move that, then it's not in the right place. This is a tricky maneuver and may take some practice to finally get it in. But once you get it right, the firing pin should slip in actually quite easily. Once the pin is in place, make sure to test it to see that the firing pin release is moving at least an eighth of an inch. You can pop the breech block back in without having to depress the slide button that you had to do to get it out. Slide the firing pin tube into the breech block where the firing pin is at the top. Follow up with the spring and the spring pin and compress it enough to seat the spring pin into the upright. You will need to remove the spring plug from the magazine spring if you're going to get that spring in properly. But you can do it by putting your thumbs at the very top of the spring plug and the spring, pulling them apart as you twist. Compressing the magazine spring into the breech block can be the most challenging part of this reassembly. But it can be made simplified if you use a 1 8 by 3 inch narrow screwdriver shaft as a guide. You will still need a lot of finger strength to hold that spring back until you can get the magazine plug into the spring and continue to use it as a guide to compress it the rest of the way. Do not feel bad if it takes you a dozen attempts to finally get that spring into place. I made it look easy, but it is not easy. If you don't have an eighth inch shaft screwdriver, here's one you can get on Amazon, although it's seven bucks. You can get one at Home Depot, a Husky, for about half that price. This is the magazine tube nut that we're trying to accommodate. Notice the SAE equivalent is 0.643. This is the socket we're going to use, which is 0.68, which is really good because we're going to capture that in a piece of wood and we have to drill a hole. And 11 sixteenths is right there, 0.684. So that's a perfect size for what we're going to do. It does not matter that it is slightly oversized from the spanner, the spanner nut. The ratchet will hold the socket while it's in the wood and will use half inch conduit straps to secure the ratchet to the wood. Here you see I just took a half inch strap and smashed it against the ratchet in the vise in order to reduce the diameter of the strap to fit the rent to the, the ratchet. This is the end result of what this video produced. The black shaft in the center is just a wood dowel that has been painted. This is a quarter inch thumb ratchet that I prefer to use over a regular ratchet because it forces all of the pressure necessary to hold our new spanner socket into the nut on the end of the magazine tube so it doesn't have a tendency to cam out in the way that a standard ratchet might. Notice how the center shaft is what keeps the spanner socket connected to the spanner nut without camming out. The socket measures one inch in length 
which is what the thickness of the wood's going to be that's going to hold the socket while we mill it. Out of my scrap bin, I figure it was faster to find two pieces of half inch material I can screw together than trying to plane a piece of two by three down to one inch. They just happened to be about the same size because they were repurposed from another jig I had taken apart. Still, it's important that the sides are perfectly flush. We need to make sure that the 11 16th hole we drill into this is exactly in the center of this board. So it's important to punch it so the drill bit can center on that punch. It doesn't have to be perfect, but that's certainly close enough. Any play between the socket and the hole can be taken up with electrical tape as a shim. Securing the ratchet to the wood acts as an anchor for the socket. Make sure to line up the thickest part of the socket with the center line of the board. You can get a 10 inch metal cutting blade at Home Depot for only about three or four dollars. You'll want to set the height to about an eighth of an inch, but if it's a little too high and you end up creating nipples that are a little too long on your socket, they're very easy to file down so that they're the perfect height. Set your fence so the first pass just clears the socket. Because your socket is perfectly centered in the board, flipping the board around means that recutting the next pass will just clear the opposite side of the socket. Now as you move the fence away from the metal cutting blade about a sixteenth of an inch each time, it will cut one sixteenth into the socket and you can just monitor cut by cut until you get down to about an eighth of an inch in your nipple width. We want to leave the nipples just slightly oversized because it's far easier to profile them perfectly with a hand file than to try to worry about it on the table saw. Once we take out the socket, good time to card it on the wire brush to get rid of all the burrs and then to test to see how far we're off. Using a hand file, to profile all of the surfaces will make them perfectly smooth and make the interface with the spanner nut perfect. To create this center shaft, begin by cutting a piece of 3 8 dowel about two and a half inches long. The inside of the magazine tube is just under 3 8 By driving the spinning dowel into the end of the magazine tube, you'll size it perfectly. Now create a step in the end of the dowel by driving the spinning dowel into the hole of the socket so that it creates a self-centering step. Now resize the step so it doesn't protrude into the socket well. Cut the dowel so that it's a little more than an inch long. Make sure to drill out the hole in the very center. If you don't drill the hole out, the dowel will split every time. Time to take it for a test drive and see how well it works. I'd say it works pretty well. Well, that concludes my three-part series on the restoration of this Remington Model 24. I hope you've gotten something from it. I try to gear all of my YouTube videos toward topics that are of interest to me and um, content that I just couldn't find on YouTube when I 
got into trying to figure out how to do something. This particular rifle, I, didn't, I don't have any particular gun expertise, and uh, this particular rifle, uh, I was very interested in trying to find content on you know, the, th the pitfalls and things to watch out for when I started breaking it down. Eh, well, that's okay. I've spent my life uh, learning by trial and error. And uh, so I, I hope that, uh, you know, the process I went through and was able to share is something that you can take advantage of. Anyway, thank you very much for watching and stay tuned for other videos I decide to produce. Thanks for watching.